Let's see now what are our options when it comes to programming Hadoop. The most important thing to think about when you are programming Hadoop is that you cannot do any updates in place. So you can process your files, but the results are going to be stored in a new file. So Hadoop does not provide you an option where you can access a very large file and then do some update in the middle of that file. The second thing that you need to consider is which approach are you going to use when it comes to programming? We will see several choices and they will differ in their complexity. They will differ in their ability to control the Hadoop and also the productivity. And finally, you should consider the developer background. Some of the approaches are better suitable for programmers, while some of the approaches are going to be more approachable to data professionals. Our first option is going to be Java. Java provides us with the fairly low level API, but it also gives us a full control of all aspects of MapReduce because Hadoop itself is written in Java. For writing daily Hadoop tasks, you will find that Java API is a bit cumbersome and you typically need to write quite a bit of lines of code in order to achieve even a simpler task. But again, you have a great control. If you still want to stay with Java, but you would like greater productivity, you should look into cascading. Cascading is an open source Java library and you program by assembling data flows and these data flows get translated to MapReduce jobs. So cascading is a very good option that combines the full power of a programming language and also gives you a higher productivity. Easier than the native Java APIs, we have Hadoop streaming. Typically, they will be used by languages like Python and Ruby. The model is simpler than using Java APIs, but it is also less efficient. The way how you would work with Hadoop streaming is that you would write map and reduce functions. The input will go as the standard input stream into map function. The results of that will be written as standard output, and that would feed in the input of the reduce function. And finally, the output creates the resulting file. So the model is fairly simple. The code tends to be much shorter than the Java code. Our next choice is Hive. Hive is a SQL-like language. So it is a great starting point for data professionals. You will find that Hive is significantly more productive than Java, but the SQL that is used by Hive is not as rich and powerful as the SQL dialects found in modern database systems. Still, we can extend Hive by writing various user-defined functions. Hive is a great starting point for experienced data professionals. One of the possible drawbacks of Hive is that as you are writing SQL, you may have to write a complex SQL statement at once. So it may be difficult to write Hive programs little by little. PIG is addressing this issue. PIG is a data flow language and its advantage is that we can build our programs out of small steps. So you can write a line, try it out, write the next line, see how will that work. And so you have a fairly iterative and incremental way of building your Hadoop programs. Productivity is similar to Hive, so much more productive than using Java APIs. But PIG itself is designed to handle relatively simple flows, so there are no control structures or iterations, and we can extend it using user-defined functions. Our next choice is Scalding. Scalding is a library that is built on top of Scala. Scala is a modern programming language. It is a descendant of Java. It runs on JVM. It's compatible with Java programs, and you can mix and match Java and Scala parts of the program. Scalding has a very elegant model. The programs will look like we are manipulating in-memory data structures that are coming from standard Scala libraries, things like collections, lists, and so on. And these programs will then get translated into MapReduce. The programs tend to require very few lines of code, which are also very easy to read and understand. And one of the things that we like about Scalding is that it is built on Scala, it is a library, so we get to enjoy the full development ecosystem, which consists of modern IDEs. We also have the tools for continuous integration testing. We will explore different options for programming Hadoop in more detail in the following sections. In this section, we will explore NoSQL stores. 
The first question that we may have is, so what is NoSQL? You should understand NoSQL as not only SQL. It is a bit unfortunate name. You should better think of it as a non-relational data stores. The reason is that some of these NoSQL stores actually have some version of SQL. These NoSQL stores have been created with the goal to address deficiencies of relational databases. And the NoSQL is an umbrella name for a variety of different technologies and approaches. One common thing is that they are non-relational and they are typically distributed data stores. Some of them are capable of executing MapReduce jobs so they can spread the processing over a number of machines. And that they are addressing the batch problem of plain Hadoop. So these databases will give us answers in real time. So let's imagine now that we are dealing with the world of relational databases. We can see that we are having great advances in capacity of disks and also in processors. Our CPUs are not getting that much faster, but we are able to deploy a larger number of them. And the processing power and the storage capacity is somewhat behaving linearly. So if I need four terabyte disk space, I would pay two times more than for the two terabyte hard drive space. So we have a fairly linear growth. Now, if you look into the relational databases, we see that it is relatively easy to start with smaller systems, but then as our appetite is growing, the cost that we have for relational databases is increasing. So we can say that when we are dealing with very large volumes, dealing with relational databases is going to be rather expensive and the performance is dropping. And we are also dealing with web scale problems where these volumes are simply out of reach of relational databases. So what we are trying to do with the NoSQL solutions are two things. First, we would like to get a linear response for the cost and performance of the system. And we would also like to allow for unlimited volume growth. We have seen that the unlimited volume growth was one of the primary goals for Apache Hadoop that we have explored in previous sections. And we are going to see how do we address the real-time capabilities with NoSQL stores. When it comes to processing, we have two approaches. One is the scale-up approach, which is commonly used with relational databases. In this approach, when you need more capability, you are getting a bigger and bigger computer. In the scale-out approach, you are running on relatively inexpensive machines, but you are going to use more of them. It turns out that scaling out is the optimal choice for growing our systems, and scaling out is the common approach that is used in a variety of the NoSQL systems. And we have seen that Hadoop is using the same approach. Typical NoSQL systems come in a variety of flavors but they have common capabilities. So they tend to be a non-relational systems. Most of them are distributed, they are horizontally scalable, and usually they don't need a fixed schema. You will find that you have a set of established players. There are always newcomers coming. So I recommend you to check every six months, there will be somebody new in the game offering some of the interesting new characteristics. And for many of these systems, you can say that they are specialized for a particular role and you may choose among many systems with related capabilities. As we mentioned, many of these systems are running in a distributed environment. And there is something called the CAP theorem that describes the behavior of such systems. The CAP theorem is saying that at most two of the following three may be satisfied, and that are consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And this theorem was established in 2000, proven in 2002. And think about our conventional systems. For example, relational databases don't have partition tolerance, but they have consistency and they are available. When we are working in a distributed setting, we are typically choosing the solution, which is the eventual consistency. What that means is that in a distributed database, a value would need to be written at multiple locations to provide for fault tolerance. So we need to have multiple copies of data that will exist on multiple machines. And here we are facing two design choices. One choice is to lock the whole system until all nodes confirm that the data is written. We will be locking a set of machines in the distributed environment. We are going to have a rather poor performance that will not be acceptable to our users. The common choice is to allow reads to reflect values that are not necessarily the latest, 
So you may be returning some values that are somewhat stale. And we hope that this is going to be okay with our users. Now, when we say eventual consistency, that does not mean days or weeks. Eventually, typically means milliseconds. But one of the big benefits is that our system is available and we are able to provide some response to the users. NoSQL stores come in several flavors. When we are working with the store, we need to choose a store that is going to be a good match for our application. Sometimes we are going to use several different stores that we may be using together. And this is something called polyglot persistence. There are four major flavors of these stores. We have a column family store. We have actually seen one of these as Apache HBase, which is running on top of Hadoop. The values are stored in columns and the systems are good for storing sparse data. We have a document-oriented databases. Typically today, they will be storing data in JSON format or XML. Then we have a key value stores that act basically as distributed hash tables. And we have graph databases that can provide for representation of very complex data models containing relationships between many nodes. When we are selecting a database for our application, we need to think about the compromise between the scale and the complexity of data. So if we put these two as axes of our coordinate system, we see that key value stores can achieve the highest scalability. Apache Hadoop that we have seen earlier is an example of key value stores, but there are also stores that are specialized for non-batch, near real-time and real-time capabilities. We have column family stores. They don't scale as much as key value stores, but they are dealing with a more complex data model. Then we have a document-oriented stores. The data models that we can store in JSON or XML are significantly more complex than what we can do with column families, but we don't scale as much. And then finally, we have graph databases, which typically don't scale as well as the other systems, but they can provide us with the most complex data model. The question is, what are the requirements of your application? You will find that if your data needs are not that extreme, you could use any of these systems to power most of your application. If you raise this bar, then you will see that you need to choose one or the other system, sometimes working together with alternative architecture to cover all the needs of your application. In this section, we will explore the two newcomers to Hadoop. These are the Apache Spark and Apache Flink. If you look in the history of Hadoop improvements, we can see that we, in the beginning, we started with plain MapReduce. MapReduce is a rather brute force algorithm, and it is not necessarily the most optimal way to run things. One of the common disadvantages of MapReduce algorithm in its traditional implementation is that it is very IO heavy. So it would be writing the data on the desk, and then this data will be read again by the subsequent tasks. Apache Tez, introduces an optimization mechanism where we don't need to have that many inputs and outputs, but the data can be directly streamed to the next stages in the processing. TES introduced significant advantages to the processing time, and it made Hadoop moving slowly from the batch into the near real-time execution. The ideas behind MapReduce are relatively old, and a couple of years after they have been introduced, scientists have been working on a couple of alternative mechanisms that are not necessarily using MapReduce. Also, MapReduce did not use a vast amount of knowledge that you accumulated in the area of relational database design, particularly distributed relational databases. So we have two systems that are building on a more optimized, more streamlined foundation. One of them is Apache Spark, which is trying to move more data processing into memory. And the other one is Apache Flink. Currently, Spark and Flink have a number of commonalities, and we are going to treat them both as the new generation of Hadoop systems. Let's see first the key element of Apache Spark. So the important features there is that Spark is trying to use in-memory data structures. And that the data structure that is used for that purpose is something that is called a resilient distributed data set. And why are they resilient? Because if the failure occurs, the data set can rebuild itself. So basically you have some trace how this data set in memory is constructed and you can rebuild it based on your actual data source. Spark is coming with a rich set of operators. 
Many of these operators are inherited from the design of Scala collection libraries, and the programs that you are writing in Spark will remind you very much to programs that you would write in Scala as if you are dealing with in-memory data collections. Spark is a rather efficient system, so we have seen a really good numbers, 10 to 100 times in memory, faster than Hadoop MapReduce. Also, the Scala API is very productive, so we have significantly fewer lines of code. Two to five times less code than if you are using rich APIs in Java, for example. The key components of Spark are the following. At the bottom, we have the Spark core engine, and then we have a number of systems on top of that. So we have a Spark SQL that is adding conventional SQL capabilities to Spark. This is going to broaden the appeal of Spark. There is the streaming API, which is combining the batch and a streaming processing. So the code that we are writing for both batch and streaming is very, very similar. Then there are machine learning libraries. There are libraries for dealing with graphs. And there is also Spark R that provides the R programming language interface to the Spark. At the time of creating this course, some of these different components were at a different level of maturity. Some of them are industrial strengths, but some of them were in early development. Internally, one of the interesting elements in Spark is the data sharing, which can be happening so that we begin with our data in HDFS, we are executing some code, we are providing some processing in iterations, and we have some result, which is held in the memory of the machines in the cluster. Then we will be processing this data in the second iteration, and then we have the results of that stage in processing again held in memory. And this data in memory can be used to answer various queries. So as you can see, it's a very efficient mechanism, which is reducing the IO and are trying to answer various queries from the data in memory. Apache Flink is the new system in Apache Hadoop ecosystem. And one of the interesting features of Apache Flink is that the programs are compiled into plans. And these plans are then optimized and then eventually executed. So if you're coming from a relational database background, you will say, well, this is nothing new. We have been seeing that in relational databases. There are access path builders and then there are query optimizers. And now we are gaining the benefits of this type of execution in our Hadoop and big data systems. Flink is a result of a European research project and it has a couple of goals. First, very high performance, then unification of batch and streaming into a hybrid runtime, and finally, simplicity for the developer. Spark and Flink have many common points when it comes to programming, and ideally you would be using Scala, very expressive language, few lines of code will accomplish a lot in this setting. Internal data structure of Flink is called the dataset, and it is similar to RDD that we have in Spark. It can be produced or recovered in a number of transparent ways, like using in-memory collections, like an RDD. Sometimes it does not need to be materialized at all, and sometimes it is updated in an iteration. So the optimizations that we have in Flink is that the optimizer selects an execution plan, similarly to what we have in a relational database, and then the system is going to optimize, and it can use the size of the input files for that. When we are running Flink, we can run it as a standalone installation over our cluster, or we can run it on top of Hadoop. That is convenient because now you can use Flink on top of HDFS. And both Spark and Flink are providing integration with many of the existing Hadoop technologies. To summarize the features and advantages of these systems, they are providing us with ability to run iterative algorithms and to do that in a very efficient way. Both systems are dealing with very good caching and they reduce the overhead in comparison with conventional Hadoop. Both systems are unifying batch and stream computing and both of them favor Scala as a natural expressive language for big data processing. And there is also support for other languages. Particularly SQL is of interest there as it will be able to address much larger data processing audiences. One of the things that I would advise you to be careful is to watch out for less mature components. Both of the systems are having areas that are relatively new and you need to watch if you are going to use them for production. 
In this section, we will introduce HBase. Let's see what is HBase. HBase is the columnar database that runs on top of Hadoop. It is distributed database. So data is stored on many machines that we have in the Hadoop cluster. And the data structure that is fundamental for it is something that is called a sorted map. This database has a very flexible schema. So the columns that we have for our tables can be dynamically added on the fly. And that the number of columns that we can have goes into billions. So it's a very different architecture than what we have with relational databases. This type of design is often called a wide table or a long row database. One of the great advantages of HBase is that it's a system that is horizontally scalable. It can be spread over hundreds or thousands of machines. And one of the other characteristics is that the data that we have can be sparse and the HBase can very efficiently store this type of data. Looking into some other characteristics, is that it provides strongly consistent reads and writes. It is also a fault tolerant system, so that one machine that is part of the cluster that is running HBase, the machine can die, and this is not going to prevent us from running computation. So data is stored in the fault tolerant fashion. Naturally, you will see that when you talk about systems like HBase, which is a representative of NoSQL systems, you will find that the systems that scale very well need to sacrifice some of the other characteristics. And in many cases, what is sacrificed are transactions. So transactions are limited. Transactions in age base would work for a single role only. But the advantages are such that age base can handle data in a range of several petabytes, and it provides excellent performance of millions of queries per second. HBase has its origin in Google technologies, particularly in the system called Bigtable that was described in a paper in 2006. Google has its own internal implementation and the HBase follows these ideas and implements them in Java on top of Hadoop. Some of the features of HBase is that it is built on top of HDFS and as various other columnar stores, it provides for very good compression. It also can deal with in-memory column families, and that provides us with significantly improved speed if our data can fit into the memory. Some of the other interesting design choices, inclusion of so-called Bloom filters, which is an approach that can provide us with a very quick resolution if an element is member of a set or not. We have also features for bulk loading, Zookeeper, the system that we have seen in previous section is acting as the coordinator for the cluster, and we can involve HBase tables as input and output for various MapReduce jobs. So you can see that HBase has a great set of advantages over traditional Hadoop and the MapReduce that we would run on it. Let's see how we would run and use HBase. During development, you would typically run HBase in a local mode. This will enable you to have really good response times, convenient for the development, and then later you can deploy it uh, on the cluster. You have a command language interface. Primarily, you will be using Hive from APIs that exist in various languages. They tend to be fairly low level. They're rather primitive. HBase on its own does not provide any query language. But there is a set of projects that are including HBase and SQL and putting them together. One notable project is Apache Phoenix that is giving us SQL on top of HBase. Let's see what is the HBase data model. We have the concept of so-called column family. That is close to table that we have in relational database. The data structure is a sparse multidimensional map. And the model is such that we have a triple of a row and column. You can think of those as coordinates. And in addition to that, there is a time step. This is something that we call a cell. And it is interesting that we are storing the timestamp that gives us possibilities to run queries in which we can ask, how did the data look like at a particular point in time? Then we have regions, which are contiguous sets of lexicographically sorted rows. They are basically representing a unit of scalability in the system. We mentioned that systems like HBase often do some trade-offs, and one of the trade-offs in many of the NoSQL distributed stores is that don't have joins, so HBase belong to this category. Now the question is then, so how are you going to use such a system if you don't have joins? Well, the common workaround or even a recommended approach is to denormalize everything. And it is perfectly acceptable in such designs 
to store data in multiple places. Remember that the primary enemy that you are fighting here is lack of performance for very large data sets. So we will be willing to sacrifice the efficiency of storage, have our data stored multiple times, but then when we need to access this data, we will be able just to go there and read it without doing any joins at the read time. And naturally, this will require you to be very careful when you are designing your schemas. So one of the typical things that you would do for a model like this is that you would decide what should be the queries that will be running over this database. And then you design your data model that everything that you need to answer a particular query is stored in one table. So you just need to go and read. You try to avoid doing any additional work at runtime. Anything besides the read is not considered to improve your performance. And we have mentioned that there is this data structure called the Bloom filters that provides us with very quick responses for misses. So if the key is not in the system, we hear about that very, very quickly. Tables and rows. A table can naturally have many rows. Each row has a primary key and HBase is not choosy about your keys and data in general. So a key is just a sequence of bytes. For a row, we can have an arbitrary number of columns. And the column is also just a sequence of bytes. So you can see HBase does not have any notion of a data structures or primitive types. Everything is just a sequence of bytes. And internally, the rows are sorted. All the data is versioned and timestamped. Column families are providing us to organize our columns. And they would be similar to things like records and objects. Basically, one column family is going to provide us for a unit of access, and we don't need to access or load the data that is not used. So basically what we do here, we are minimizing the data movement, and we can design our system so that the related things go into the same column family, and that will give us performance advantage. And then the other things that you can do with the column family is you can define various settings like compression, version retention policy, or cache priority. Regions are subset of rows. They will be automatically sharded and they would be acting similar to range partitions. So they enabled us to also more efficiently design our system. The API that we have for HBase is rather simple. And normally we would use it from Java programs. And it provides a fairly low level operations like get, put, delete, we can scan for values, increment column value, and we have also MapReduce as a source and sync for our data. So fairly low level API, you would typically use them from the Java programs, but you should also consider looking into Apache Phoenix that provides us with an access from a SQL and uh, normally in programs, then you could be using a JDBC to access the HBase data. In this video, we will discuss when to use scalding. So when to use scalding? Well, the first reason why would you like to use scalding is to benefit from the power of a full programming language, as opposed to pig and hive, which are somewhat limited in what they can do. The other reason why would you like to use scalding is to fit into the ordinary software development lifecycle. So we have test-driven development, we have continuous integration, we have all the usual things. The next benefit is that the code that we are writing with Calding is rather short and it is easy to understand. The intent of the program is easy to deduce from the code. Sometimes the organizations may start with Hive and Pig and they recognize they don't have all the support that they need to write more complex big data programs. For example, if you need to do some machine learning algorithms, you often have to do iteration. And this is something that is very difficult to do in Hive or Pig, or you have to even escape their boundaries and use some command shell scripts to run programs in multiple iterations. In Scala, you can do that naturally. You would just use a loop in Scala and program it in that way. Scalding is going to be a good match if you have big data developers who are not afraid of real programming language. And this can be a factor. Depending on your organization, big data developers could be coming from the database background where they might be familiar with SQL, but they could be challenged to program in real programming languages. And one of the reasons to use Scalding is to attract top developers to use cool state-of-the-art technologies. And we have seen that already with Scala. 
It is not absolutely necessary to use Scala to achieve the functionality of their products. But with Scala, which is a very hot, advanced language with great productivity, you often get better developers to sign up for your team. There are situations where Scala is not the ideal choice. Imagine that you are doing work in the organization where the only thing that you do is very basic ETL. The developers that you have don't have the background in programming, so they would like to stick to something that is rather simple. In that case, Hive or Pig could be a better choice. Sometimes the big data developer culture that you have does not welcome programming. Again, this is related to the background of the people that you have. And you need to consider that the Scala, which is necessary in order to use Scalding, is a powerful but a complex language. It is a very rich language and you cannot learn it overnight. So learning Scala could be too challenging without proper training or a guidance. In these situations, we would prefer to stick with Hive or Pig and use Scalding on more complex projects. In this video, we will see the basics of programming with Scalding. So let's do the obligatory program, the word count. Let's see how do we write it in Scalding. First, we have the import statement. We will be importing stuff from the Scalding libraries. The underscore at the end indicates that we are importing everything. Import statement has no consequence on the runtime. It is just something for the compiler. And then we say that we have a class word count job. We can pass some arguments and we are saying that this class extends a job. The job is the super class for the word count job and provides some common functionality. Then in the next line, we are indicating our source of data, which is the text line. It is a very primitive input mechanism and we are passing the arguments with the value input as a string. So as we run our program, we will be passing the input and output defined as strings and we will be opening HDFS files with these names. After the text line, we are indicating a flat map instruction. Flat map is going to take the line of input and it is going to create words. And the way how that works is that we are going to take each line of text and we are going to split it using a separator like space or new line and similar. So we are going to split the words the meaning of flat map is that we will not just have a collection for each line and then the collection contains the words, but we are going to flatten it. So the end result is that we will have a collection of words in the whole file. The next line is group by. So we are grouping by the word, then we are taking the size of that group. So basically we will count how many words of the same kind we have. At the end, we are going to write the output. We are indicating that we will be writing in a TSV. TSV stands for tab separated values. It's one of the simplest data formats. And then we will be writing in the file that was indicated as output. This input and output are defined as strings that we will pass in as we are running our program. So as you can see, the program is fairly short. And for a Scala programmer, there are almost no surprises here. The program nearly feels as if you are using ordinary built-in collections from the standard Scala libraries. How do we run Scalding? Well, there are two modes. The first mode is local mode. Local mode is going to run on your machine. It is great for development. You have very fast turnaround times. And what we really like about it is that it enables us to do test-driven development. We can write our unit tests, we can try them out, and really we can improve the reliability of our programs. When we are done with development in the local mode, then we can deploy our programs on Hadoop. The nice thing is that we are deploying the jar file as we would do with completely ordinary Java programs. So from the point of view of MapReduce and Hadoop, there are no differences between the Scala program and the Java program. Scalding provides us with three APIs for dealing with big data. The most commonly used API is what is known as the field API. It is very easy to use. We are accessing fields in our files and this API is untyped. So that means that compiler is not going to be able to check everything in our program. This is the oldest API. It is the most popular and very, very easy to use. The next API, which is growing in popularity, is the typed API. So we are indicating what are the types of columns in files that Scalding is accessing. 
The big benefit for us is that we are able to benefit from compiler checks, so we will be getting fewer errors at runtime. Now, this is something that is quite interesting for big data programs, because you would really prefer that you get error message from the compiler. Then, when you are running your program on Hadoop, maybe you are in the second or third hour of execution for a very large data set, and then you get a runtime error. So, ideally, we would try to get as many compiler errors and warnings during the compilation time before we really run our programs on big Hadoop cluster. And finally, something new and unusual in these APIs is the metrics API. And this API allows us to work with big data metrics calculations. So the system is enabling us to deal with sparse matrices with huge dimensions. And this is something that we can do for graph processing, for machine learning, something that we cannot do with other tools for programming Hadoop. Now, for all of these APIs, one thing that is a big benefit is that the APIs look very similar to what an ordinary Scala developer already experienced when working with standard libraries for Scala. One of the benefits of Scalding is that it provides access to a variety of external stores. So it provides adapters for accessing relational databases and variety of NoSQL stores. So we can access HBase, which is the real-time database that runs on top of Hadoop, Apache Cassandra, a NoSQL database of the columnar type, MongoDB, a popular document store, and that improves our productivity because we can tie in various sources in our programs and you can achieve a mix of big data on Hadoop combined with a variety of other stores. Let's see now what are our options when it comes to programming Hadoop. The most important thing to think about when you are programming Hadoop is that you cannot do any updates in place. So you can process your files, but the results are going to be stored in a new file. So Hadoop does not provide you an option where you can access a very large file and then do some update in the middle of that file. The second thing that you need to consider is which approach are you going to use when it comes to programming? We will see several choices and they will differ in their complexity, they will differ in their ability to control the Hadoop and also the productivity. And finally, you should consider the developer background. Some of the approaches are better suitable for programmers, while some of the approaches are going to be more approachable to data professionals. Our first option is going to be Java. Java provides us with the fairly low level API, but it also gives us a full control of all aspects of MapReduce because Hadoop itself is written in Java. For writing daily Hadoop tasks, you will find that Java API is a bit cumbersome and you typically need to write quite a bit of lines of code in order to achieve even a simpler task. But again, you have a great control. If you still want to stay with Java, but you would like greater productivity, you should look into cascading. Cascading is an open source Java library and you program by assembling data flows, and these data flows get translated to MapReduce jobs. So cascading is a very good option that combines the full power of a programming language and also gives you a higher productivity. Easier than the native Java APIs, we have Hadoop Streaming. Typically, they will be used by languages like Python and Ruby. The model is simpler than using Java APIs, but it is also less efficient. The way how you would work with Hadoop streaming is that you would write map and reduce functions. The input will go as the standard input stream into map function. The results of that will be written as standard output and that would feed in the input of the reduce function. And finally, the output creates the resulting file. So the model is fairly simple. The code tends to be much shorter than the Java code. Our next choice is Hive. Hive is a SQL-like language, so it is a great starting point for data professionals. You will find that Hive is significantly more productive than Java, but the SQL that is used by Hive is not as rich and powerful as the SQL dialects found in modern database systems. Still, we can extend Hive by writing various user-defined functions. Hive is a great starting point for experienced data professionals. One of the possible drawbacks of Hive is that as you are writing SQL, 
you may have to write a complex SQL statement at once. So it may be difficult to write Hive programs little by little. Pig is addressing this issue. Pig is a data flow language and its advantage is that we can build our programs out of small steps. So you can write a line, try it out, write the next line, see how will that work. And so you have a fairly iterative and incremental way of building your Hadoop programs. Productivity is similar to Hive, so much more productive than using Java APIs. But Pig itself is designed to handle relatively simple flows, so there are no control structures or iterations, and we can extend it using user-defined functions. Our next choice is Scalding. Scalding is a library that is built on top of Scala. Scala is a modern programming language. It is a descendant of Java. It runs on JVM, it's compatible with Java programs, and you can mix and match Java and Scala parts of the program. Scalding has a very elegant model. The programs will look like we are manipulating in-memory data structures that are coming from standard Scala libraries, things like collections, lists, and so on. And these programs will then get translated into MapReduce. The programs tend to require very few lines of code which are also very easy to read and understand. And one of the things that we like about Scalding is that it is built on Scala, it is a library, so we get to enjoy the full development ecosystem, which consists of modern IDEs. We also have the tools for continuous integration testing. We will explore different options for programming Hadoop in more detail in the following sections. We are going to explore the key elements of the Hadoop infrastructure. First, we have name node. The primary purpose of the name node is to manage the metadata for the HDFS. Now, considering that no processing on a Hadoop cluster will happen without HDFS working properly, one of the key tasks for the name node is to remain accessible. And that would naturally lead us to install it on a machine that should be more reliable than the nodes on which we are doing the processing. The metadata, which is the information about our files, is held in RAM. And this is why the machines that are running the name node, they should have a lot of RAM. Another term that occasionally shows up in discussions of Hadoop is the secondary name node. And many people believe by mistake that this is the backup for the name node for high availability. And that is not correct. Secondary name node is not a backup, and its purpose is to offload some of the housekeeping tasks to another machine. The second part of our hardware infrastructure consists of data nodes. Data nodes are going to do the processing, and they also store the data in normal files. We have seen that HDFS is built on top of the ordinary Linux file system. Now, the name node is going to access the data in the HDFS cluster, and the name node needs to know what are all the different blocks that are needed to assemble a file and treat it as one unit. So the programs will read the data from data node directly, having direct access to the data. And we already mentioned that a typical organization is that the large files are split into blocks, usually 64 or 128 megabytes of blocks. And having larger blocks makes for easier management. Our processing consists of map and reduce tasks, and these tasks are running on our data nodes. One of the interesting things here which makes Hadoop different from traditional processing of data with databases, is that we are not going to send the data to the program. Instead, we are going to send the programs, in our case, our map and reduce jobs to the data nodes. And the processing will happen there using the data which is stored on the local disks. If you think about how this map and reduce task run on nodes, we can examine a cluster. In this cluster, we have a set of nodes here represented in blue, these nodes contain data and these are our data nodes. On the left, you see the master node, which also has the name node. When you write MapReduce program, the first thing that you will do is you will copy this MapReduce programs to each of the nodes that contain data. So this copying is the first part of our processing. And the Map and Reduce jobs will process the data that resides on the disks of these machines. Naturally, you need somebody to coordinate and keep track of the execution, and that is the purpose of the job tracker, which executes on the master node. 
Now, when you have this Hadoop infrastructure, you need to manage it in some way. You need to deal with standard tasks like starting and stopping the servers, adding and removing the servers in our cluster. And also you may want to view what is happening on a particular server. You may want to examine the log files. In the beginning, the Hadoop management tools were rather sparse, but as Hadoop was going more and more mature, we have seen that there is a larger number of tools. Some of them are open source tools, but particularly vendors who are providing some additional value on top of the open source are coming with very appealing user interfaces that allow us to very effectively control our Hadoop clusters. In this section, we will explore the Hadoop distributed file system and the ways of interacting with it. Now, if you are thinking about how would you store data that is used for MapReduce, the first requirement that we have is that the data needs to reside on multiple machines. The second requirement is that we should be able to store any type of data. So the data does not need to neatly fit into tables like in relational databases, but it can be unformatted data. It can be text, it can be images. So we don't have any particular requirement on the type of data that we are storing. And here we have one problem. The first problem is that as we are running on a cluster with many machines, there is quite a bit of likelihood that at some point one of these machines is going to die. And if a machine dies, we don't want to lose the data. So one of the critical parts of Hadoop solution is how do we store the data on multiple machines without encountering loss of data if something dies? The idea that we have is to create a distributed reliable storage. The question is, how would we do that? The solution for that is the Hadoop distributed file system. And we will see now how it works. The first thing that we do is we are going to take a large file and we are going to break it into blocks. These blocks will be stored on multiple machines. We call them nodes. So each of these machines is going to get a subset of data. And you can see here, node one is going to have some fragments of this data. Node two is going to have something else and so on. Here on the left, you see the master node. A master node has a special purpose in the Hadoop cluster, and it contains the part which is called the name node. A name node has one important piece of information, and that is it knows on which machines are which blocks residing. So it is almost like a table of contents. The next thing that we have with our Hadoop distributed file system is the replication. In order to achieve a fault tolerant solution, a piece of data would need to be stored on multiple machines. And here we have in this illustration, our fragment of data number one is stored three times. And in fact, this is the default replication of data in Hadoop cluster. So every piece of data is stored three times on different machines. One of the things that you need to think about is that we are actually using more space than it's really necessary for every individual piece of data. But we don't worry about that. The disk is cheap. And what is important is that we have the fault tolerant solution that can survive a death of a machine. Now, if you think about some other solutions that we have in this space, for example, RAID drives, RAID drives will also store data in redundant fashion. When we are storing data on the Hadoop cluster, typically we store the data on plain ordinary drives, so without using any RAID mechanism. Looking into the HDFS, we can say that the data is first split into blocks, and then the data is distributed across the machines in the cluster. And by default, each of these blocks is replicated three times. One of the interesting things that we have is that the machines that we have for our clusters are fairly cheap machines, and they tend to be relatively unreliable. They are not using the most expensive and the most sophisticated hardware. So we expect that these machines are going to die. Our HDFS provides us with a reliable solution where we don't lose the data. HDFS in its realization resides on top of native file systems. And normally these machines are running Linux, so HDFS resides on top of that. We have seen in previous illustrations that we have some blocks and that these blocks are typically going to be relatively large, 64 to 128 megabytes. 
And all of these ideas that we have in HDFS are following the ideas that were originally created for the Google file system, which remains as a proprietary implementation. So now where we are thinking about how should we apply HDFS? Should we better work with many small files or should we better work with fewer files that are rather large? The sweet spot for Hadoop is to use a smaller number of large files. And the typical size of these files is going to be over 100 megabytes. Now, when we are thinking about our processing, and you may remember when we explored MapReduce algorithm, we were reading the data from beginning to the end. And this is something that would be important for HDFS. You don't have the random access to piece of data in HDFS. So you normally read your data from the beginning to the end. And why is that good? This is good because it minimizes the cost of seek and we don't do updates on such files. If we need to write something new, we would put that typically in a new file. So you need to remember when you are dealing with Hadoop and HDFS, there is no random access. We will see later some solutions that reside on top of HDFS that will allow us to do some changes. And that would be the HBase, which is the database that runs on top of Hadoop. We said that we have fault tolerance, and for that we have a replication. The default factor is three, but you could also go higher in some situations. In this section, we will see how MapReduce algorithm works. So we are going to explain MapReduce on a little example. Imagine that we have a file, pets.txt, and imagine that it's a very large file that contains various entries, dogs, cats, birds, and so on. What we would like to figure out is how many dogs, how many cats, and how many birds are in this file. So what are we going to do first is we will start from this pets.txt file, and then we are going to split it into lines. So we will have each line that will contain some of our pets. What we will do next is we are going to map these lines and we will extract the dog, cat, bird, and we are going to generate pairs, dog and number one, cat, number one, and so on. And we are going to do that for every pet that we find in the file. As you can see, this is a very primitive function in which whenever we encounter a pet, we emit a pair with the pet kind and the number one. This step in processing is called the map. So we take the output and we transform it or we extract something interesting out of it. Then we are getting to the next stage in processing, which is called shuffle. In the shuffle, we are going to move all of these entries. So we have all dog entries in one place or cat entries in one place, and then finally birds in one place. What we will do with this shuffle is that now we have all the dogs in one place and then we can aggregate the values. And this is done in the next step, which is called the reduce step. And we find that we have four dogs, three cats, and two birds. When we get the results of this reduce step, we are going to put this all together into our result file with pet frequencies. Now, if you look at this algorithm, you're going to find that there are a couple of things of interest. First, there is a map and reduce function. This is something that you would have to program on our own. But if you look at the shuffle, you can see that shuffle can be done quite mechanically. We are going to take the kind of pet, we can use it as the primary key, and we are going to put all the values that have the same primary key in one place. Now imagine when we apply this algorithm to big data processing, we can have that all dogs are going to be processed on one computer. And then in the reduce step, we are going to collect these results and eventually store it in some files. So as you can see, MapReduce algorithm would profit a lot from brute force approach. If we have many machines on which to execute map and reduce, we can really improve the speed of processing and we can distribute our effort across many machines. Now, looking into the MapReduce processing model, let's summarize a couple of interesting points. First, our input is going to be split into pieces. Different machines are going to process individual pieces. And these machines, we often call them worker nodes, will process these pieces in parallel. So we could gain a lot of efficiency by having many machines. Now, if you think how is this going to run on actual machines, you can imagine that the results 
can be stored in local files. And then the reducers, which are also going to run on these machines, would be able to access these files and process them. So in the reduce step, we typically perform some aggregation. We are reducing the values that we have obtained from the map steps. And as we have done with the map step, we have number of machines that are engaged in this processing. Looking into programming this type of systems, you can see that here we can talk about separation of work. We have programmers who would need to provide map and reduce functions. We will see various ways how this can be done. One can use a language API, for example, in Java, a bit tedious, but it gives us full control over the process. Or one can use some of the higher level languages or libraries that improve programmers' productivity. But the beauty of Hadoop and MapReduce algorithm is that the programmers can focus really on map and reduce functionality. There is a whole set of areas that are dealt with the Hadoop framework. One of the most important things when we are dealing with larger clusters is dealing with fault tolerance. The machines are going to die and we still need to provide a reliable processing. Programming a fault tolerance in systems is a very difficult task and very few programmers are having sufficient experience and knowledge to do it. The other interesting thing is that if you think about a solution in which we have lots of data stored on these different machines, we will have the assignment of worker machines to map and reduce tasks. This can also be done by the framework. Now, one of the very interesting things with big data framework like Hadoop is that we will actually move processing to where the data resides because we have a very large volumes of data and it would be very inefficient to move this data through the network to the processing. And this is something what we do with conventional database systems. We remove relatively small volumes of data. The other thing that the framework can do is this shuffling. So moving of data from a map processing to the reduced processing is something that can be done by the framework without a need to program that. And finally, one of the interesting areas is dealing with errors. Our programs may experience various errors and we need to provide solution to handle those errors. Now, these are all the benefits that a framework for applying MapReduce can give to us and so dramatically improve our productivity so we can focus on providing this map and reduce steps. Before we go into the programming of Hadoop, we will need to understand a little bit better how Hadoop works. And that will be the goal of our next sections. Let's see now what are some of the challenges with relational databases. We are going to use a simple diagram. On one axis, we are going to show the volume of data that we are trying to process. And on the other axis, cost of our database and the equipment. If we look at the cost of our equipment, the storage space and the processors, we see that we can achieve a fairly linear cost. If we need two times more space, we need to pay two times more. When it comes to CPUs and processing power, we don't uh, get much faster CPUs than before, but we can get them in larger numbers. So multiprocessors and the multi-core systems are becoming the norm. Now, if we put in this perspective the cost of our relational database systems, we will be surprised that the cost does not behave in such a linear fashion. So we see that when you start with relational database, your cost is low. You may start with some open source, small database, and later you graduate to some of the more commercial systems. Eventually you end up with fairly large systems and then they are going to be very, very expensive. And there are two problems here. One problem is that the processing is relatively slow. The more data we have, the relational databases are going to become slower and slower. And then for large volumes of data, we are going to pay a really high price in order to be able to have relational databases that can handle those. Not only that, but when you're dealing with truly large volumes, you are going to have problems that relational databases cannot handle them. And that was actually one of the motivations that we have seen in the companies that started processing data on the web scale. Companies like Google and Yahoo, they have figured out that relational databases simply cannot store the data that they would like to deal with. What we would like to do is to find a solution, find a technology that would be able to take the cost of the relational database and flatten it, make it behave more like the cost of our storage and our processors. So we would like to avoid the exponential cost of such systems. We would like to have a linear dependency. And uh, the other issue that we would like to address is that we would like to be able to handle data that cannot be handled with relational database systems. 
So there are two factors. One is improving the performance, reducing the cost. And the second issue we would like to address is to enable us to deal with data that the relational databases cannot handle. Now, this is where the categories of systems like big data systems, Hadoop, variety of NoSQL systems come into play. They are trying to address different aspects of these problems and enable us to have the processing of larger volumes of data much faster than uh, we do that today with relational databases. You will see that there is no silver bullet. We are going to explore several different technologies. Each of these technologies is going to have its sweet spot. Some of the technologies like Hadoop is going to focus on handling this largest volume of data. Some of the technologies are going to focus on processing of data in real time, handling streams of data that are arriving into our systems. Some others are going to focus on representing data, which format may vary and where you cannot find the schema that you can subscribe from the very beginning. Some other systems are going to focus on storing information as graphs with large number of nodes that are connected with each other. In the rest of the course, we are going to explore these approaches and you will learn how to find the system that will be the best match for your application. We have seen a set of problems with relational databases and big data. Now we are going to outline the key approaches that help us deal with this problem. First, we have the new processing approaches. Among them, the most significant is the MapReduce algorithm, which is at the heart of the Hadoop approach. MapReduce algorithm is a relatively old algorithm discovered in the 50s, and it is used in mathematics and later implemented in uh, language Lisp. And somewhere around 2004, it got some attention as a potentially very useful in big data problems. After that, we had a whole range of different algorithms that emerged. We have seen some algorithms that are newer, dealing with data sets primarily in memory, as we see in Apache Hadoop. There are some other approaches, for example, in Apache Flink. These are all descendants of Hadoop and MapReduce. And besides those, we also have some newer data technologies that span data storage and data processing. The most significant player here is Hadoop with its HDFS, Hadoop Distributed File System, which enables us to store very large amounts of files across many machines. And we can do that in a redundant way. And then we split the processing across this many machines. Not only Hadoop, we have a range of different data stores which use different techniques and different mechanisms. They typically don't deal with such huge volumes of data as Hadoop, but we are still in the area of big data. And we are going to see different flavors of NoSQL stores that we have. One of the more recent developments is the emergence of stream processing. With stream processing, we are handling data that is continuously coming into our system. And we are typically processing data within some window of time. And we are providing a real-time or near real-time results. As you can guess, there is not one silver bullet. And in many of our applications, we will be combining different solutions. We will combine Hadoop with some NoSQL stores and streaming. And this is how we will cover the needs of our applications. Let's talk now about some characteristics of big data. The first characteristic of big data is naturally the volume. The amount of data that companies generate today is really staggering. If you think, for example, about the New York Stock Exchange, it generates about one terabyte of data, of trade data, for every trading day. If you look, for example, at Twitter, Twitter generates tens of terabytes of data, and this data can be fed into the sentiment analysis. And based on that, we can discover what people feel about various products or events. Volume is going to be particularly important as we are having our devices that are sending data. For example, power meters are generating billions of readings every year. And imagine we can analyze this data to optimize the energy and actually foresee the demand for power. Velocity is another important characteristic. For various time-sensitive activities, for example, if we are detecting fraud, seconds can be decisive in being successful or not. The other aspect of this velocity is when we try to combine the data that we are getting in real time with the data that we have from before. Another good example is the sensor data that we are getting. For example, in modern cars, you have nearly 100 sensors, and these sensors can generate a very large volume of data arriving in a very rapid pace. 
Variety is another component. We said that traditionally business generate transactional data, but now with users being on the internet, users generate tremendous amount of data, images, text, videos, and we need to process all of that. And finally, one of the interesting characteristics is veracity. Can we trust the data that we have? And it is interesting in one poll of the various business leaders, they stated that about one third of them actually does not trust the data that they have in their organization. So determining if some data is truthful is very important challenge for big data. Big data workflow. It is not enough just to store and process the data that we are getting. We actually need to include this data into a bigger picture that we have in our enterprise. So the first thing that we need to do is, of course, to acquire the data. This acquisition can happen in various ways. Sometimes the data will arrive in a batch mode. For example, when we get large files that contain, let's say, sales records and similar. Sometimes the data will be coming as a stream. For example, when we have various sensors that are generating data, or if you are collecting Twitter data that is coming in real time. We need to store this data. And it is interesting that traditional databases do not provide a good answer for storing this data. So we will see later different mechanisms and approaches that have been developed to store this data. The principal idea there is that the data will not be stored on one machine only, but the data will be spread in a fault tolerant and reliable way across many machines. And that poses challenges. The next step is analytics. We will be applying various mechanisms. Sometimes these are going to be queries in a way similar to what we do in conventional systems. Sometimes we will apply data mining, sometimes machine learning, and we have a quite a bit of options how to try to figure out useful information in our data set. When we get this information, we need to present it in such a way so that somebody can act on it. Visualization is one of the key aspects there. Showing just numbers is usually not enough for most humans. So we need to have some visual, easy representation so we recognize the trends, recognize significant events, and recognize when should we act. The next thing in our workflow is the management of data. You need to figure out not only how to put this data on your systems and how to process it, but also what is the structure of this data? How are you going to integrate it with conventional systems in your organization? Who will have access to this data? How are you going to manage the users of this data? How are you going to approach security and similar? The data that we collect needs to be shared. And sharing of this data is a particular problem because we are dealing with staggering amounts of data. So you cannot just put it in an email attachment and send it to somebody. We are dealing with such volumes of data that impose a challenge. Sometimes you will find that it is optimal way to use a fast network connection. In some cases, it is surprising, but FedExing hard drive or set of hard drives with data can be actually faster. And finally, we got to the point of integration. It is extremely important for your success in big data that you always integrate your conventional systems with your big data systems. Conventional systems are still the cornerstone of modern business. And they have many activities that are truly best suitable for this type of systems. How do we combine the big data and traditional data processing is very important subject. And you must cover the topic of integration very early in your enterprise. Talking about this whole workflow, the key thing for us is that the business needs to see a value from the big data chain. It should not be just viewed as a technical exercise. It really needs to contribute to higher revenues and some benefit of the business. And we need to execute all of that elements of the workflow in a cost effective manner and in a reasonable amount of time. In this section, we will talk about some challenges related to big data. One thing that you will see in almost every presentation about big data is that we are facing an unstoppable information growth. The amount of data that we are handling is rapidly increasing. So if we illustrate the growth of data, we will see that we have a tremendous growth and we are actually just at the beginning of the curve that is going really straight up. When we look into the big data sources, we want to see what are the key sources for this big data. 
Traditionally, we have our business transactions. Various business systems are generating data and we have more and more of this data. But it is interesting that this part is relatively well understood. We have our relational systems that quite successfully handle this area, but there are some associated forces with that. One of the big changes in this space are the social media. We have Facebook and blogs and Twitter, and the users are generating tremendous amounts of data. Now, this data, as you will see later, cannot be really successfully stored in relational systems. And this area was actually very important when it comes to introduction of new data stores, which can handle this amount of data. In addition to this, we have arrays of unstructured data. So we have a tremendous amount of text that is generated, text that we would like to analyze. We would also like to understand what is this text about. Increasingly, we have other non-structured data like images and video. And imagine you would like to be able to make queries about who is in some video. So conventional systems really don't have good support for dealing with this type of data sources. Sensors are one of the most exciting new sources for big data. Sensors can generate a tremendous amount of data that we need to store and process. And it is likely that sensors are going to be the most interesting new contributor to the growth in big data.